Believe it or not, Halloween is about more than superhero costumes and abundant candy. Everyone's favorite spooky holiday has a long and interesting history that has its origins in pagan celebrations and tricksters named Jack. This is the messed up history of Halloween. Once upon a time, Halloween wasn't just an occasion to get dressed up in costumes and go begging for candy from door to door. If you go back far enough in history, you'll find that Halloween has its roots in an ancient festival. It was a celebration that marked the end of a fruitful harvest and the coming of a cold winter and death. The ancient Celtic festival of Samhain was something of a New Year celebration. It was held around November 1st on the modern calendar, and it acknowledged the warm and lush seasons of spring and summer were coming to a close. In their place, the cold and hard times of autumn and winter were to take over. Many believe that in this traditional period between the life-giving part of the year and the frigid winter months, the dead were closest to the living. Some dead spirits could be communicative or even helpful, while others might prove to be more troublesome. Deities were also appeased with bonfires and sacrifices. Religious leaders such as Druids attempted to foretell the future with assistance from the spiritual energy thought to be at its peak then. Nowadays, a jack-o'-lantern is a classic symbol of Halloween, but the cartoonish depictions of a grimacing gore don't really speak to the dark legend behind its origin. Oh, you didn't tell me you were gonna kill it! Most versions of the jack-o'-lantern legend center on a tricky man named, obviously enough, Jack. An Irish version of the legend refers to the man as Stingy Jack for his overly thrifty nature. This Jack was an incredible penny pincher, and for some reason, he invited the devil to drink with him. Jack managed to get the fiend to transform into a coin to settle the tab. He quickly pocketed the devil coin next to a silver cross, only releasing the demon on the promise that he wouldn't claim Jack's soul when the man died. That worked fine at first. The devil kept his promise upon Jack's death and left the man alone. Yet it turned out that God didn't want him either, leaving Jack to wander the earth as a spirit. At least the devil gave Jack a hollowed-out turnip with a lump of glowing coal to light his way. As Irish people began to immigrate to America, the legend came with them, and it turned out that the New World crop of pumpkins was much more plentiful and suitable to carve than a hard old turnip. Thus, the gourd-based jack-o'-lantern was born. The tradition of wearing Halloween costumes may go back to the days of Samhain, when disguising yourself had both a religious and a practical purpose. Costumes worn around this time of year were meant to help wearers avoid scrutiny from wandering spirits. The disguises usually employed skins, horns, and other preserved animal bits to conceal the wearer and help them fit in with otherworldly entities. As the holiday adapted, these costumes also helped conceal the identity of pranksters who tormented people in their community. And conveniently enough, they could often blame the mischief on ghosts. As Christians began to move into Celtic regions, Samhain slowly began to transition to a less ritualistic version of itself with the faithful expected to spend the next day in religious observance. But costuming continued, with some people going door to door begging for treats like soul cakes in exchange for offering up their prayers for departed souls. Bats are actually a pretty helpful member of the ecosystem that devour annoying insects, but they also have a spooky reputation and very often turn up in Halloween decorations. True to their nature, some bats may have been attracted to the tasty insects drawn by Samhain bonfires. Many bat species are also nocturnal, further increasing their supposed association with ghosts, pagan deities, and the underworld. It's unsurprising that in the popular imagination, they have gone from an innocuous flying mammal to a harbinger of Halloween tidings. Meanwhile, the witchy reputation of black cats made them an easy fit for the spooky holiday. After all, how often do you see a ginger or tabby cat in a Halloween display? The association between Halloween and black cats may have started in the Middle Ages, when people were often frantically working to root out evil witches in their midst. Black cats, with their eerie dark coats, were frequently associated with evil doers working at night. Some even believe that black cats were witches who had the power of transformation at their disposal. Soon enough, this particular variety of feline gained an eerie reputation. It spread even further when European immigrants took their tales and traditions across the Atlantic Ocean to the Americas. Trick-or-treating seems like a pretty sweet deal, all things considered. A cute little kid dresses up in a costume, goes door to door, and gets candy in exchange for the phrase trick-or-treat. We should do this every year. I just wish we hadn't filled up on all those kids before we got to the Flanders. But in medieval Europe, that interaction was more of a two-way street, at least spiritually speaking, and someone's very soul could hang in the balance. Trick-or-treating has its roots in a begging practice that's known under a variety of names, including souling and guising. Richer folks would receive the poor of their communities and give them soul cakes, a special seasonal pastry. 
Those who received the cakes then promised to pray for the souls of the house's dead relatives. Eventually, kids started to take up the practice and added in costumes and song and dance routines. Instead of receiving a cake, they might receive other food, money, or even a nip of ale. It turns out that the Great Depression has more of a hand in contemporary Halloween celebrations than you might expect. Even when you go to a haunted house attraction these days, there's a hint of its history among the jump scares and grotesque characters. It all started when Halloween pranks got out of hand in the early days of the Great Depression. With youths going so far as to flip cars and nearly derail trains with their antics, adults decided that something must be done. The kids needed a more controlled distraction. Enter the Haunted House, one of any number of organized Halloween festivities that included trails, parades, and trick-or-treat events. The reasoning went that if kids were in an organized haunted house, then they couldn't be tearing the town to pieces. And if a local nonprofit got to make a bit of money off of it, all the better. Maybe this seems rather cheesy to modern viewers, especially those who are used to the intense, professionally produced haunted attractions available today. But even these gentler haunted houses were better than some communities' ideas to completely ban Halloween fun altogether. Some cities seriously considered the idea. However, they realized that the angry trick-or-treaters might prove to be too much to deal with in the face of such an extreme measure. If annoying and even dangerous pranksters weren't enough to stop Halloween, World War II was, at least for a short time. In 1942, Chicago and some other cities did cancel Halloween celebrations, and not strictly because of all those wild pranksters. Instead, it was because of increasing restrictions on resources during wartime. Patriotism also came into play. One superintendent of schools in Rochester wrote that even the seemingly innocuous prank of soaping up someone's windows wasn't all that great. After all, didn't our boys overseas need that soap and grease more? And ringing doorbells and then running away was just another way to make the life of an exhausted wartime factory employee all the more tiresome. So kids were even pushed to take pledges to behave themselves, promising to back the fighting men by observing Halloween in wholesome, squeaky clean fashion. This meant that for a while at least, the mailboxes and front porches of local homes were safe. The night before Halloween is often called Mischief Night in New Jersey. It's also ominously known as Devil's Night in Detroit, and confusingly to outsiders, it's called Cabbage Night in parts of the northeastern United States. The evening has historically represented an opportunity for widespread misbehavior and destruction. And while many may like to blame it all on rotten kids, there's a more concrete social and historical explanation. Mischief and pranking neighbors have been a part of Halloween since its beginnings as a Celtic ritual. One especially awful trick in 19th century Scotland involved setting a smoldering cabbage stalk up against a keyhole so that the unfortunate homeowner would arrive at a house reeking of burned veggies. Immigrants brought these traditions to the U.S., and the mischief really seemed to ramp up to frantic levels in the 1930s. Some historians have argued that the increasing stresses of the Great Depression and World War II could have pushed some youths to act out. Every Halloween, after all the parents get drunk, the teenagers come out and they go freaking crazy. They ride around town on their bikes, vandalize stuff. While kids were out turning the town upside down for much of modern Halloween history, young adults were tasked with something far more significant, finding a spouse. Even though Halloween was a mostly secular holiday in the U.S., autumn was still a time of year where people felt more inclined to fortune-telling, and many anxious young romantics in Europe and the Americas used apples to do so. It makes sense considering the long link between fruit and fertility, and the fact that apples are pretty abundant at the close of the harvest season. Apple bobbing was a way for people to get a hint at a future match. In some cases, young women would make a secret mark on an apple. The apples would then be collected and dropped into a large bucket of water. The hopeful women would then watch the men stick their heads in the buckets and come up with an apple in their mouths. The girl who made the mark was said to be matched with the boy who retrieved the apple. Another apple-based fortune-telling technique involved peeling. Hopeful women would attempt to peel an apple in one continuous piece. Then they'd toss the scrap over their shoulder. They were looking for the peel to fall in the shape of someone's initials. The idea here is that the formed initials would supposedly indicate the name of their true love. While trick-or-treating may seem like a pretty harmless childhood tradition, some busybodies have argued that it's extortion. Whether or not you agree, the practice does kind of look that way when it's considered in a certain light. After all, the practice does involve kids asking for candy as a form of protection money. Consider what might happen to the front of your home if you're stingy with the candy, or especially if you commit the ultimate Halloween sin of handing out something awful like dental floss. It's certainly more of a one-way street. Though you could always ask the kids to pray for souls stuck in purgatory if you're feeling a bit old school. At least they'd be doing some extra work for all that sugar. This distrust between trick-or-treaters and candy-distributing adults may have had its roots in the 1930s when tricking was definitely more popular for some than scrounging for treats. 
There are accounts of people suffering from tipped over trash cans and destroyed bird baths when they ran out of candy for trick-or-treaters. And some alarmist newspapers even went so far as to claim that the rougher sort of trick-or-treaters were just future gangsters. For many observant religious people, Halloween is the devil's holiday and feared because of its pagan associations. As Christianity became the dominant religion in Europe and the Americas, it had a vested interest in demonizing the old gods. Some early Christian practices folded the pagan observances into its calendar. For instance, when in the 8th century, Pope Gregory III moved All Saints Day from May 13th to November 1st in an attempt to put a Christian gloss on the spookiest time of year. However, quite a few Protestants felt that this was too close for comfort, especially as the latter half of the 20th century saw the rise in evangelical Christianity. Starting in the 20th century, some Christians even went so far as to have anti-Halloween parades and attractions known as hell houses that graphically depicted the consequences of sin. Some hell houses do not hold back, warning of the bloody, satanic perils of issues such as drunk driving and domestic abuse, as well as more divisive topics such as gay marriage and abortion. Despite the dire warnings from these groups, most people in the U.S. still see Halloween as a fun, silly holiday where a lot of candy is consumed and a few tricks are performed. It's a far cry from its darker, ritualistic, and more sinister origins. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about creepy stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.